Good morning. Today on Spotlight, the leading legislative sponsor of the new bill repealing Michigan's controversial right to work law. Why did this Democrat from Lower Wayne County lead the charge? And what's the business future for this state that has a long, rich union history? We'll ask State Senator Darren Camilleri of Michigan's 4th District. And later on our Sunday morning program, why CBS Health is investing $11 million in Detroit neighborhood housing and partnering with Wayne State University's medical school. Will this collaboration truly help alleviate health care disparities and improve the overall well-being of its citizens? Dr. Janae Caldoun, Chief Health Equity Officer at CBS, and Dr. Haley Thompson of Wayne State University's Medical School will join us. It's Sunday, April the 2nd. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Uh, you just got the governor to sign your right to work legislation, repealing Repeal, right to yes. work. Uh, be very clear about that. Um, did you think it would happen this fast? We're only three months into this new term. So we obviously made it a top priority for the legislature in this first couple of months. It was one of our first six bills that we introduced when we got into office in the first place. So we knew it was a top priority for our agenda. Um, but quite frankly, I think that we moved a little bit faster on all of our items than I really had anticipated. Uh, I trust that in your opinion, in the governor's opinion, you would feel this is one of the benefits of a democratic trifecta, the first one in 40 years. It's not only a democratic trifecta, it is a pro-worker trifecta. We are going to be balancing the scales so that workers have a voice at their workplaces across the state. And we'll be showing the world that we are here to protect workers in every way that we can. Eric Nesbitt, who's the minority leader of the Michigan Senate, of which you're a part of, was on this program a couple weeks ago. You don't agree with that, right? No, I, I think Senator Camilleri is, is really off in left field on, on his comments on this. It's very simple. Right to work provides workers the freedom to choose whether they want to join a union or not, whether they believe that the union actually uh, provides value to them. Uh, forcing that choice that anyone contradicts the right of free association principles that this country is founded on and is really unconstitutional. It is clear that when this law was first put in place, it was a, not only a gut punch to workers, but it favored businesses in a way that actually took away rights from workers across union workplaces in the state. We know that it's important for workers to have that voice at a collective bargaining table, but when this law was enacted, it not only gutted so many different unions, it told uh, businesses that they had the upper hand over workers, that they could take advantage of them, that they could put more, uh, take more money out of a system, out of their pockets, maybe force them to have higher health care costs, maybe force them to have lower wages. That's not the state that I think any of us want. Regardless if you are a Democrat or a Republican, we should be supporting workers because we know that when workers have more money in their pockets, they are the ones that spend and put more money back into the overall economy so that everybody can thrive and everybody can succeed. Your loyal opposition on this uh, says that this basically holds out a sign that says Michigan is not open for business and not competitive with some of our other neighboring states. You don't buy that. I don't buy it because there are states in the South that, yes, take advantage of their workers. That's not a state that will help us build a strong middle class economy. Michigan is the home of America's middle class. And in order to do that, we need to support our workforce everywhere that we can. I don't want to be competing with states like Alabama or Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I want to be competing with the states like uh, Minnesota or New York or California that have higher wages for their workers everywhere. And so that's a, a bar that we should be setting for ourselves. But to be clear, uh, Democrats in this trifecta are the ones that are supporting good union jobs by supporting things like the, the Ford Battery Plant here in Michigan that Republicans opposed. And so we are creating jobs, supporting unions and union workforces, and creating a state that we know is a reflection of where we want to go. States that have right to work laws have a uh, at least 13% decrease in wages compared to states that don't have this law on the books. And so we know clearly from the data that higher wage states are states that, have, that do not have right to work laws. 
including Michigan. So we want to change that trajectory so that we can be now in a better place. Wages have dropped uh, here in Michigan. Unionization rates have dropped since this law was put in place in 2012. And so the data is actually on our side. And we know that we have a stronger argument to make. And businesses don't make this the number one reason why they choose to locate to a state or not. What are you hearing from the rank and file since all of this has gone through? Because you're out and about in the community yeah. and you're actually on a on a break from the legislature now, so you're back in the district talking with the average people. So I was picking up dinner at a local restaurant the other day and while I was waiting in the lobby, uh, a couple of different union workers came up to me unprompted and said thank you for repealing this law because they know that at their workplaces it was something that made an unfair uh, practice for not only them and their co-workers, but it made it harder for them to do their jobs. And so people are coming up to us and thanking us. I have one of the highest rates of unionization in the entire state. So my, my district has you know, teachers and police officers, firefighters, union auto workers, uh, and every, every other industry in between. But we know that this is going to make a marked difference for not only their workplaces, but for their pocketbooks too. All right, we're gonna take a little quick pause for the cause. We'll hurry right back right after this. Is this a done deal? I mean, my, my hope is that uh, we see efforts in the next uh, cycle uh, in the election to put this in the Constitution. I, I would like to see that. Is that good? Would that be good? I think that uh, voters showed back in 2012 that they, they did not like this law when it was first enacted. I think that the, the data is on our side, polling is on our side, that voters actually support unions more now than ever before. And so I think that we're in a stronger position to defend unions and working people across the state. I think that it's important that uh, the legislature reflects the will of the people, and this is exactly why we repealed this law in the first place. We are the first state in nearly 60 years to reverse this policy, uh, and we don't see that happen very often because uh, a lot of business interests have carried so much weight in these conversations, regardless of what people have said. Their argument, though, is we're the first state to do this in 60 years because it's bad for states, and that's why you don't see other states doing it. But they, they are framing this in a race to the bottom. And so I don't want to be in a position where we're competing with the lowest wage work, uh, situations, the lowest wage uh, states. We want to be competing with the highest wage and best uh, you know, quality of life uh, situations and communities that are possible. Senator, how much of this is political payback for what was done in the first term of uh, Governor Rick Snyder's administration when he said, and I just talked to him last week uh, before the Historical Society of Michigan, and he said, he asked the Republicans at that time, uh, this is not high priority for me. Don't put it on my plate right away. Uh, they went ahead and put it on his plate. He, said he, he signed it into law. Uh, he now defends it and feels as though um, right to work is good for states. Uh, but is this just political payback? Is it, you all did it to us. Now we've got the power, we're doing it to you. So to be clear, they did it to workers. They didn't do it to Democrats or to people on, uh, on our side of the aisle. They did it to, they, they had this gut punch to workers that really decimated unions, not only here, but it decimated the morale in the, in the workplace uh, that we see at all union shops all over, all over Michigan. What I think is important here is that even though people feel like this is a political thing that happened to them, Democrats have been the minority in the Senate for 40 years. Uh, in the House for 15 years. And so Republicans are just starting to feel what it feels like to not be in power anymore. But here's the clear difference. Voters are, are demanding that we take action on many, many items, and we're delivering on all of those things in such a short period of time because of the inaction that we saw from our Republicans who led this legislature for, for decades. Um, changing of the guard and leadership at the UAW. Uh, your thoughts? So I'm the proud son and grandson of UAW auto workers, and I believe that the UAW is uh, a driving force for not only my family, but 
you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Michigan families. I think that, you know, we are hopeful that the leadership of the UAW can come together. We know that the d division on both sides of that election was really, really strong. But it is important that they come together to not only ad advance for workers because there are historic contracts that could be coming up, but it's important that, that everyone in the country knows that the UAW, especially here in Michigan, is going to be continuing to lead the way for the middle class, just like all of our unions have across uh, the country. Democrat leadership in the Michigan legislature, both houses have been pushing for it for quite some time, but now they have the power and perhaps the votes to be able to control this, this gun control legislation. Um, how close are you to this happening? Uh, it looks as though it's on a really fast track. So we made this a, a, our seventh priority uh, in terms of this first part of our agenda because we know that action needs to happen now. Families have been waiting, students have been waiting for, again, decades. School shootings should not be the norm. I'm a former teacher. And even when I was a student myself, having to go through active shooter trainings, mm -hmm. not only was it traumatizing as a student, but then to have it escalate as a teacher myself, and then to see now as a policymaker that still nothing has changed, we are now making those changes happen. So we've passed universal background checks, we've passed safe storage laws, and we are uh, very, very close to passing extreme risk protection orders. Uh, once we return, I think that'll be the final thing that we send to the governor's desk for now. Uh, putting new legislation, more legislation uh, on the books will make a difference because your opponents say it's not the guns, it's the people. They love banning everything else, right, when it comes to uh, things at our schools, whether it's books uh, or the ways that you can talk about history. But when it comes to guns, they don't want to talk about anything that would rein in the unregulated system that we currently have. We know that the facts are on our side. Universal background checks are not only supported by 90% of Americans, 95% of Michiganders support those policies, including gun older, uh, holders as well as uh, Republicans. They support us on these policies too. And so we know that they will make a difference. Will it solve every problem? Of course not. But we've got to make some measure of change happen now while we have the opportunity to do so. Oh, last question, time is always our worst enemy. Uh, education, huge issue for this state, uh, any state. Last year, under the Whitmer administration and with help with the legislature, uh, more money went to public schools than uh, in recent history. Uh, where are we in terms of this year's budget and will schools get more money than what they got last year? So I'm chairing the school budget in the, the state Senate, and as a former teacher, this has been my number one priority since I've been elected to office. We will see another historic school budget this coming fiscal year. Uh, we are going to prioritize a lot of different things, including student mental health, as well as uh, teacher recruitment and retention, because we do have a teacher shortage on our hands, and I'm hopeful that we'll be in a position to right the ship and be a state where uh, Michigan is the home of the best educated students, we have the best education workforce, but that has to start with some historic changes in investment, and that's what we're looking forward to doing when we return. And you expect school leaders to be able to have the budget in place, uh, I think it's June, uh, so that they can make the key decisions that they have to make. That's certainly our target. Uh, can never make any official promise, but we believe that we'll be able to get that done as soon as we can, ideally by, uh, by the end of June. Are Democrats moving too fast? too soon and might this come back and uh, ricochet and hurt you next election? I think that voters have already shown that they are grateful for our swift, swift action and showing that we are a, a leader, a leadership uh, team across the legislature, both the House and the Senate, that will deliver on the promises that we made. And I think that's a refreshing view of state government in a way that they've not seen before. So I hope that they'll reward our, our good efforts and see a state government that actually reflects the will of the people for the first time. All right, Senator, thanks so much for coming in, joining us today on Spotlight. And when Spotlight returns, we'll talk to Dr. Janae Caldoun of CBS Health and Dr. Haley Thompson of Wayne State University Medical School. We'll be right back. And hey, welcome back to Spotlight. Joining me now is uh, Dr. Janae Caldoun, uh, now with CVS Health. Uh, you remember her from her position with the Whitmer administration, which she was in the hot seat a lot, but a little, little different these days. And next to her is Dr. Haley Thompson of Wayne State University School of Medicine. Thank you, ladies, for joining me today on Spotlight. Uh, Dr. Caldoun, you stood with Mayor Duggan and others 
not too long ago, broke ground on an $11 million investment in the city. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that, what you hope to accomplish with it, uh, and how you made that leap <laughs> from what you were doing before to this. A little, Ab little different. Absolutely. You know, no, totally honored to be the inaugural uh, Chief Health Equity Officer at CVS Health. And what that means is that I really help the company, uh, Fortune 4 company, Aetna, uh, Caremark, of course our pharmacy chain, um, but really making sure that as we show up in communities, we do it in a way that leaves no one behind. So recently, as you noted, we did make an $11 million investment in affordable housing in the Brush Park neighborhood. Mm -hmm really about making sure people have access to healthy, affordable housing. And we also know about the important connection between, between housing and health. If you're worried about having a, a roof over your head, it's really hard to think about being healthy. So that's really why we are investing here in the city in such an important way. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Thompson, Wayne State has partnered with CVS on this. Uh, we always hear about people, the importance of getting your annual checkup. but. That's just a little teeny portion of it. It really has to become much more than that, be able to make a difference in these communities, correct? Absolutely. We are so excited about this really remarkable partnership that we have now with CVS Health, and we're just grateful to Dr. Caldoun and others there. Um, we are, this partnership is helping to support our Center for Health Equity and Community Knowledge in Urban Populations, and the acronym is CHECKUP. And what is interesting about that is community knowledge is at the center of this both figuratively and literally. We really want to advance our partnerships between academics and researchers and scientists at Wayne State University, uh, accelerate those relationships with people in our community, our community-based organizations, our community stakeholders, towards health equity and towards um, health equity research. So uh, what Dr. Thompson is referring to is our Community Equity Alliance that we just recently launched a couple of months ago at CVS Health. And it's part of our broader health equity strategy, which is really about engaging our over 300,000 colleagues so that they actually understand why health disparities exist and have the tools to be able to address them. It's about data, making sure we understand disparities and are really developing very specific tactics and strategies to address them. And then it's about really bold action and this Community Equity Alliance is about that. It's really about elevating the voices of community members. We know there's so often a gap between health care organizations and the community, and that's why this Community Equity Alliance partnership with Wayne State University, one of our first partners, is really, really important. Um, what is it that you tend to find most in terms of the health inequities? All right, so certainly, Checkup is focused on heart health and cardiovascular health. We know that in the city of Detroit, their uh, rates of hypertension and heart disease are higher when you compare to the rest of the state. So uh, we also have these disparities when it comes to mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the drivers of those outcomes are related to poverty and related to access to care, right? So, and we know that folks who live even in our persistent poverty areas have worse outcomes. Our goal is to not only focus on the city of Detroit, but also to emphasize what we call persistent poverty census tracts. Those are areas where at least 20% of the population have lived in poverty for over 30 years. So these are long-standing issues that we know affect health outcomes over time. Uh, people, regardless of income, know that, okay, if I go to the doctor or I go to a health professional, I need to check whether or not I have diabetes. I need to check whether or not my heart's in good shape. Um, but there's always been a stigma related to mental health. Um, and we're seeing that talked about a whole lot more now, if for no other reason, because of all these terrible gun shooting tragedies that we see across the country. Are we breaking through that stigma and that stereotype so that people realize your mental health checkup is as important as any other physical checkup? I think we are breaking through somewhat. I think that mental health is definitely more of a part of the conversation that people are having um, culturally and in our communities and in our families. And I think that I know that there is greater emphasis on what um, everyday people can do to support um, better mental health outcomes in their communities. I know part of that work is uh, through community health workers, which I know CVS Health is uh, placing a focus on. How can we draw upon people, trained professionals coming from our communities who can help to normalize some of these issues around mental health and getting mental health care, getting the support and care that they need. Okay, we need to take a quick little break. We'll come right back with some more questions right after this.
CVS is a profit-making company. So what, what's the bottom line for you all? Why are you all doing this? Absolutely. At, at CVS, it's really about bringing our heart to every moment of everyone's health that we, that we serve. We serve over 100 million people every single day. And my role is to really, again, make sure we're doing that in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind. So, for example, we have uh, our health zones. So we're actually partnering in five communities across the country to address those social drivers of health. That means things like access to, a, to affordable, healthy housing, uh, access to healthy, affordable food as well. We also have our Project Health fans who go around the, 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 the country actually and provide health screenings as we've, we've talked about so that people really understand diabetes, hypertension. Do they actually have risk or, or elevated levels so that they need to follow up with a primary care doctor? I'm still a practicing ER doctor at Henry Ford Hospital. I love my work. I don't know when the heck you have time to do it, but okay. <laughs> I, I enjoy that. Uh, as, as you noted, worked in the city and, and for the state. I, I love just serving people and helping communities to be healthy in, in many different ways. Have you had a chance to talk with your former boss, Governor Whitmer, recently and about this partnership or anything else? Yes, we, we do stay in touch and, and, and absolutely recently saw her as we welcomed the, the World Health Director, World Health Organization Director to the state. So absolutely, I'm, I'm a fan of, of, of Governor Whitmer. She just uh, is amazing, has had uh, just incredible leadership across the state. Sure. You have several events coming up, I guess, over the next couple months or so. Yeah, throughout, talk, the oh, throughout the year. Throughout the year. Talk a little bit about that. I think the most recent one will be on April the 3rd. April the 3rd is going to be a listening session uh, that's going to include a lot of our Wayne State University staff and faculty to understand what their needs are when it comes to partnering and, and engage, partnering with and engaging communities. You know, many researchers and scientists are not taught how to build authentic, meaningful, equitable relationships with the community partners. And we need their voices at the table as we think about health equity solutions. So the April 3rd event is going to really be focused on our faculty and staff. On April 27th, later in the month, we're going to be doing a program at Fellowship Chapel. Um, and in Detroit, in yeah. Detroit, and we're going to be talking about tools, resources that people can use, not just our faculty, but community members, organizations, stakeholders can use, again, to build partnerships and lay a foundation for doing meaningful health equity work. Okay. If people want to get more information about this, I assume they can go to a website? Absolutely. They can go to checkup. Wayne.edu. Okay, check up Wayne.edu. My vision is that everyone in Detroit has an opportunity to, to thrive. Uh, we know that COVID-19 ravaged Detroit like it did many other urban uh, areas uh, across the country. And so I really think uh, elevating the voices of community members, really understanding what's happening on the ground, uh, elevating and implementing more community health worker programs. I'm really hoping that we see more and more Detroiters uh, seeing that they have an opportunity to thrive in the city and are healthier, importantly. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.